Hello and welcome to another edition of No Nonsense with Pamela Wallen. Well, where to start? We have Liberal cabinet ministers saying you only get a break from the carbon tax if you vote Liberal. We have provinces of all descriptions basically saying, bring it on. We're going to have a fight about this. We've got a Supreme Court decision on Bill 69, food strategy, just transition. I don't know where to start. So we decided to call Trevor Toom, professor of economics at the University of Calgary, a research fellow at the School of Public Policy. And he does something really interesting. He's uh, co-director of Finances of the Nation, a project amongst academics and with the Canada Tax Foundation to actually collect the data. But that's for a whole other day. (laughs) Trevor, welcome. Good to see you. Great to be here. Thanks for having me on. You were you were saying just yesterday, so let's start on the carbon tax mm. fiasco. I don't how, know how else uh, to describe it when you take your signature policy and blow it up, but uh, that seems to be where we are. You say that you think now um, the carbon tax is dead, and the prime minister says, no, it's not. There'll never be another carve out ever again as long as he lives. What do you think? Well, well, I think prior to the announcement of exempting home heating oil from the federal carbon tax, just three days before then, we had key ministers in the government explicitly rejecting calls to exempt home heating by saying that the carbon tax puts more money in the pockets of Canadians and that doing so, removing the carbon tax from this kind of fuel would make pollution free again. So those are quotes yep. of the minister. And, and then three days later, just reversing course on that completely. And, 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 it, and it's one thing to exempt some fuels from the carbon tax. I think there there is, in some cases, a really strong case to, to do that. I think about diesel for electricity generation in far northern communities, things where it's very obviously not something... Uh, that's going to be responsive to the carbon tax in that particular case, and carving it out I think has a has a stronger case to it. But to exempt wholesale all of home heating oil does undermine some of the rationale for the carbon yeah. tax, which is well, and and you can't on the one hand say you, you make more money from the rebate than it costs you to to use these fuels. And then say, we need to give you a breather from it and a break from it because clearly it's costing you too much. Yeah, that's that's not a, an internally consistent position to take. Now, now I think it is true, at least in the, in the short term for the average household, rebates do exceed the amount of carbon taxes paid. But that's not true for everybody. No, and it's indeed, not true if, if you drive up and down highways. Indeed. In and, and so... You know, what we also saw the government do is boosts, for example, the rural rebate and from 10% higher than urban to 20% higher. Now, that's a policy where I think is fairly interesting. If the rebate's not large enough, then we can change that. Or if it doesn't cover people, to your point about commuters as well, maybe we should differentiate suburbs from downtown cores. I mean, there's lots of interesting things we could think about doing in terms of how we're targeting the revenue recycling component of the plan. But whether one supports carbon taxes or not, and there's lots of reasonable disagreement here, its rationale is very simple, provide an incentive to lower emissions. But critically, everyone should face the same cost for each ton that's emitted, whether it's in Alberta or Nova Scotia, manufacturing or services, big big industry or small, a ton is a ton from the perspective of climate. But now the government's kind of rejecting the central argument for carbon pricing in the first place. And that's why I think it's started a process now, fundamentally changed the conversation around carbon pricing that will eventually lead it to be either significantly weakened uh, with further exemptions or potentially removed altogether, at least at the retail level. I think the larger yeah. meter systems. Will well, stand. let me ask you about that because there's a couple of things. So uh, this comes ex- also at the same time where the government is attempting to gut bill C234, which was to give a carve out or some relief for farmers who need to dry grain or heat barns because they have animals. That was voted on by all four parties and there was uh, and it passed it came to us and then in the senate and now people 
are proposing amendments that basically have the the in, the effect of of gutting that and removing that incentive. So that was also the context in which this was happening, which was kind of a double whammy uh, on the West uh, in particular, although there's farmers everywhere. Um, and I'm just trying to think what what the rationale is. I mean, this is, to your point, their core idea, uh, their mantra. There are lots of other ways to give people benefits that don't undermine the core. You just have the rebates higher or any number of other little things that you can do. So do you think they're deliberately uh, trying to set the stage for a walk back or not? Well, that's a really difficult question. Not being a fly on the wall of discussions right. in caucus or around the cabinet table, it's hard to know what the underlying motivation is. And, and sometimes in government, you have to make quick decisions that sometimes you regret <laughs> later on. Um, and that, that's <laughs> this, this might be just an example of that. And I, yeah. I go back to the minister only three days prior to yeah. this decision being taken. That suggests to me that it was a very quick decision. And that yeah. it was not one where there was broader cabinet consultations around what the implications of it might be. And so no, that's, I think, of, problematic uh, to see yeah. such, a, such an important decision being taken so quickly without a lot of deliberation. At least that's my impression. So we um, have the Premier of Saskatchewan who reacted pretty quickly. Um, and for those of us who, you know, um, are from the West, we remember the uh, the impact of the national energy plan. We remember uh, the prime minister's father, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, saying, why should we sell your wheat and other sort of things that were dismissive of Western Canada. Um, so it, it just, it, the premier in Saskatchewan just said, okay, I mean, if you're going to break the law and treat people unfairly, I mean, not technically break the law, then we're going to do the same. We just won't collect this damn tax and we won't send it to you. I mean, he even admitted that it's probably an illegal act. Yeah, that, that was a very interesting development. So first, the federal decision to exempt home heating oil, while not I illegal in the same sense, is right. a violation of the federal government's own benchmark that is used to evaluate carbon pricing systems. So let's not forget, it, you know, this only started in Atlantic Canada on July 1, right. and there were previous provincial proposals for their own pricing systems that did exempt home heating oil, and the federal government deemed them not compliant with the federal benchmark, um, which intuitively is substantively similar to what we see in British Columbia. Uh, and and now they're exempting home heating, which is in violation of their own benchmark. And so Some Saskatchewan home heating, <laughs> sorry, home heating oil. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And, and and Saskatchewan's interesting because Sask Energy as a crown corporation is, is something where the the premier, although they did actually have a unanimous vote in the legislature there as well. So it's not just the premier. This is no, this multi party. Vote. This is broader. Yeah. Uh, they can kind of issue orders to the Crown Corporation. Now, I'll leave the legalities to others to explore. It's certainly an interesting situation uh, for some officers of that corporation, maybe thinking yeah. about what this might mean for them. But Saskatchewan, unlike Alberta, can do that. Uh, we have because they have a Crown Corporation, because they have a Saskatchewan. Exactly, yeah. exactly. But now we're seeing conversations in British Columbia uh, around whether or not to remove the provincial carbon tax there from heating fuel. And this is something explicitly put out by one of the, the two main parties there, the BC United, and I, we'll see where pressure goes from there. But it's, it's not just a uh, left-right issue. This is a multi-party yeah. raising concerns here. And, and in Alberta, the governing UCP and opposition NDP completely agree uh, yeah. on, on this issue. If there's a case a unique case around home heating uh, needing to be exempt from the carbon tax. And again, I'm personally maybe not convinced by a lot of those arguments, but I, I could see where one might make those arguments. I they mean, you're a carbon tax guy. You actually it, think you're a good thing. Yeah, as a substitute for regulatory approaches that really do rely on government discretion around where emissions should be lowered. And I think governments tend to know where the least cost 
ways of avoiding emissions are located. And so I, I tend to look at the market-based uh, solutions, although nothing's perfect. And I recognize there's problems with carbon pricing as well that maybe we can get into. But yeah, I don't look at this um, and, and feel, feel very good about it. I think it's something that's undermining a policy that is in principle, something that's neutral, that's economically efficient, and it's going to then lead us to a position where the federal government is going to need to rely more on regulatory tools. And some of those I find very concerning, like a cap on oil and gas emissions. That's effectively another policy that's regionally targeted yeah. uh, in, an, in an adverse way that just inflames some of the tensions that we're seeing rise in Canada, which is beyond climate policy, something that we should be concerned about. Well, and, and that kind of leads me a little bit to the recent Supreme Court of Canada decision on Bill uh, 69. So called by those primarily in the West, but those who oppose it, uh, there will never be another pipeline bill, or we could say never be another massive energy project bill again, or its proper name, the Impact Assessment Act. But even in the face of Supreme Court decision, we saw the environment minister say, no big deal. We'll carry on. Watch this space. We can still do it. Yeah, I, I have found some of the ways that the federal environment minister to engage in a lot of these difficult issues sometimes unproductive. You know, not just on the <laughs> on the climate file, but here on on this particular uh, legislation that the Supreme Court ruled on it. And it's not just about the energy sector either. I think about potential mining activity in Ontario, especially around critical minerals. Yeah. Um, something that'll be very important long term for us in the world. The viability of those projects are there's implications of this kind of federal legislation there, and and this space is one where we necessarily need both provincial and federal cooperation. I mean, there's areas of environmental um, jurisdiction that are unambiguously federal fisheries, right? right. And, and that's that's solid, uh, but then. Areas of of unambiguous provincial jurisdiction too, and and we do need some alignment here. And for political leaders at, at, in both orders of government to use this file as a way to achieve short term political objectives rather than thinking about the long term prosperity of the country is problematic because they both need to work together. We need some way of having a joint, smooth. Uh, system that's not overly burdensome on uh, proponents of these projects that we do need to see more of, not just Canada, but the world. Yeah. And I mean, when you think about a, a big energy project, which is purview of the provinces, but if you're going to include First Nations groups, purview of the feds in, mm -hmm. in many cases. So if you're actually going to help the people that you say you want to help or, or um, help Canadians heat or cool their homes or whatever it may be, you actually have to work together. There, there is no other mechanism. Yeah. And and Canada is a very decentralized country, set up that that way deliberately for lots of good reasons. And there's there's trade-offs there. And one of the trade-offs is that we do need uh cooperation across borders of government. And and when governments work well together, then we can see some really big successes from that. And we have historically seen many areas. Uh, of, of such success, I, I think actually about the Canada Pension Plan is one of these areas yeah. in the late 1990s, where you had Ernie Eves and Jim Denning and Paul Martin, different parties, different interests working together in a in a way that that I think we need to see more of, but unfortunately haven't in some time. Well, and kind of brought that that plan back into the in you know settled the books and said it's it it's got to be able to survive and live and so we need to to do this well I, I, well let's just go on that tangent for now but i want to come back to some other other things related explain if you can um why the premier of alberta daniel smith has proposed this notion of um exiting from the CPP and setting up a, an Alberta plan. Even the polls in the province suggest that there's not anywhere, like a majority of people don't want this. It's like, just leave it alone. I'm fine. Yeah. So this is not a new idea for an Alberta pension plan. Even in the original debates around the Canada pension plan in the 1960s, there were members of parliament that on, on the floor 
of the House of Commons were uh, exploring the idea of a separate Alberta pension plan and what that would mean for the CPP. So this is a very yeah. uh, old idea, and it, it's really I guess, gained strength in the past two decades or so in the Saskatchewan province. took a run at it as well with yeah, and, and there is a Saskatchewan pension plan, although yeah. that's it's it's a kind of a voluntary program. Yeah. It's very different than what Alberta's contemplating here. Yeah. Um, and, and I guess the core argument for an Alberta pension plan is sound. Uh, the province is younger, and a younger population would have an easier time sustaining a public pension plan. Uh, contribution rates could be a little bit lower as a result. Uh, but it's not a slam dunk. There are trade-offs to consider. A smaller plan would be less diversified, more exposed to economic shocks than the broader Canada pension plan. So there's a risk-reward trade-off here yeah. to consider. And I think why some of the, the polling is pretty uh, averse to the idea is, is the idea of adding risks to a pension is something that I think rightly doesn't sit well uh, with many, where this is a, a critical component of retirement income mm -hmm. and that we rely upon. And the idea of amplifying risks in that space um, I think rightly should be viewed with a lot of caution. Like I've had conversations with people who say, look, all of this pressure from um, you know, from the crowd that is is uh, focused on um, the environment almost exclusively, that the ESG, you know, you can't invest in any companies that have oil and gas or or in a country where human rights are abused. And and it, it all seemed reasonable at the beginning, and then it kind of grew and grew and grew, and that people want their pension plan to be invested in things that will make them the most money, not right. that makes them feel good. <laughs> Yeah, and that is the mandate of the Canada Pension Plan Investment Board, which is, which is uh, I think, the right mandate. Yeah. Maximize returns, subject, of course, to having the cash flow that you need to make good on uh, on expenditures that that uh, yeah. fund the benefits that people receive. And that's the right mandate, uh, maximize returns. And we do have a system where we... Uh, have a board and 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 many individuals actively managing the Canada Pension Plan fund uh, with that goal in mind. And to change that mandate would require two thirds of the provinces representing two thirds of the population plus the federal government yeah. to agree in order to amend the the actors. Would be a very yeah. difficult thing to do. So. Some are indeed concerned about whether or not investments will be. Uh, allocated in such a way that's not maximizing returns, but trying to achieve these other objectives. And we do see that in, in many settings, divestment campaigns for university endowments or something that, that comes up every now and then. But that's not something that the CPP can do without violating its mandate, which it, it won't do. And it's not something that any given prime minister could unilaterally do. Uh, without the broad agreement of two thirds of the yeah. provinces and two thirds of the population, so I'm less worried about the Canada pension plan allocating its resources in a way that doesn't maximize returns. Um, now, uh, there's reasonable, uh, I guess, differences of opinion around how effective the CBP is and whether it could do better in some point right. to its relatively higher costs, and that's an important conversation to have for sure. But if if the concern is around biased investment strategies, well, then something like the CPP is the, the, the best way forward and that it's protected from political interference in a really unique way. And, and kind of fads of the day sort of thing in, in that. Uh, so again, I just, I wonder why, I mean, part of what goes on in my mind is just thinking like, we see this in politics all the time. Look over here, look over here about this pension plan while other things are going on here. The the federal government yesterday, the finance minister basically just saying, oh, we're going to focus on the CPP. So Alberta's kind of given her that uh, issue when we can see the numbers on many other economic matters not great, not to mention the carbon tax discussion we just had. So it's kind of like a distraction. Is there something that that um, the premier is looking to distract from or what would motivate? 
Well, this this as an issue, as I noted, is long standing, and I think I, I think in in part for many, it's genuine the support for an yeah. Alberta pension plan. A young population, younger yeah. contribution rate, and and of course, you know, I'm. I do disagree with uh, the LifeWorks estimates around how much the contribution yeah. rate, but, yeah. but we both agree the contribution rate would be lower and meaningfully lower. Yeah. And and that's that's a real reduction in payroll taxes, both on workers and businesses. So that so, is a benefit. And then we just need yeah. to ask, well, is that benefit worth the cost? Worth it. So um, now another, oh, sorry. No, I just, I'm wondering, so you think that this is, she's committed to this, she believes in this, and she will just do the work necessary to change the mind of her population, but that's not going to change the mind of opposition leaders, other premiers, et cetera. So then what happens? So if, if, it is genuine, and I think partly the government may have overstepped with an overly rosy projection about what an yeah. Alberta pension plan is. Yeah, there there is a reasonable path forward that that is consistent, I think, with this appropriate historical interpretation of the Canada Pension Plan Act, where the asset withdrawal uh, would still ensure an Alberta pension plan is viable, and that wouldn't necessarily require the Canada pension plan contribution rates elsewhere increase. And so my, my estimate there's around 20%, um, subject to caveats that the publicly available data is a little bit limited in several important ways, but that gives us a sense of what might be reasonable in that scenario, CPP contribution rates elsewhere wouldn't necessarily need to rise. So it, there is a way to exit and, and whether it's a wise thing to do or not, that doesn't actually destabilize the Canada pension plan as a whole. And this is an area where provinces have unilateral authority. Um, Alberta can leave and no one can stop it. What other provinces in the federal government can do is shape the terms under which Alberta withdraws. And, and that's critical. That certainly matters. Um, so if, if it's genuine and if polls start to change, then hopefully the government of Alberta starts to to think about more reasonable scenarios rather than taking 53% of the CPP assets, which I don't even think is an appropriate interpretation of the act itself. But even that aside, would, other provinces would, in the Fed yeah. would just amend the act to clarify it in a way where it takes that scenario off the table. I mean, we we watched some of these negotiations with the province of Quebec, like, you know, what are you going to pay for your chunk of uh, the highway or the airport or, you know, like it it then gets down to the nitty gritty if if Alberta decides to act, um, you know, unilaterally on this. So it, do you what's your gut tell you on that, that that she can change minds? So my my gut is no. In that I think what we've seen is a, a great deal of marketing, actually. And maybe it's hard yeah. to appreciate outside of Alberta, but $7.5 million um, you know, apparently goes a very long way to flood the space uh, yeah. of uh, pro-Alberta pension plan advertising, plus the engagement panel as a kind of vehicle to more broadly communicate the benefits based on this single piece of analysis that the government commissioned and the polls so far haven't moved. Yeah. So I think that that was interesting to see. And I have trouble imagining that that's fundamentally going to change in the coming months. But and, when the federal government does something like it does on the carbon tax and says, uh, here are new favorites, because we, you know, and if you don't vote liberal, you're not going to get similar kinds of breaks. That's also a context in which people yep. go, okay, maybe we maybe we should, you know, push back and maybe we can do that on the pension plan. Like that's the yep. trouble with all these things happening at the same time. That's that's an excellent point. And and really what how I viewed the equalization referendum that we saw that's in Alberta a couple of years ago. It 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 wasn't as though anyone was under the illusion, I believe, that. Alberta could unilaterally change the equalization yeah. program or amend the constitution and so on. But it was a, a way to signal strongly, or some viewed it as a way to signal strongly to the rest of Canada, some of the frustration that exists in, in Alberta. And, and there's always frustration in, in different parts of the country necessarily right. because we're so diverse. Federal policy is not going to land um, the same in different parts of the country. But 
but yeah, we I think we've seen on a lot of files just a lot of compounding pressures yeah. on on Alberta's economy and and how many Albertans view their place in the broader confederation. Now that it does worry me for the pension plan to be wrapped up in that because it is an area where Alberta could unilaterally leave. Like it has constitutional authority to do so there. And if it's a decision taken out of anger, then we might come to regret it later on. So I I hope that cooler heads prevail. And on the carbon tax, there's certainly ways for the province to, um, push back in the sense that if the feds don't extend the exemption to natural gas, and I do suspect they will, uh, Alberta could simply reintroduce its own carbon tax. And then as is being discussed in British Columbia, exempt home heating. Yes. If the, if the federal government recognizes their own plan as acceptable, I mean, Saskatchewan has that. Well, they've now set a new benchmark. And I think that if they don't recognize something that exempts home heating along the same lines as what the federal government has done for three years. uh, On their own petard, for sure. And it comes back to this. I mean, the, 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 the whole just transition plan that's been simmering there which everybody believes is just you know double talk for we're going to get everybody out of the oil and gas sector shut that down and everybody's going to have a so-called green job i mean that's again uh this whole move is just gonna people are just gonna say oh uh, you know no thanks yeah i find that conversation around it around the just transition quite problematic in in for a lot of reasons you know first <clears throat> you know, jobs and employment opportunities are always in flux. Technological change, international trade creates opportunities in one location with a certain set of skills and creates real challenges in other sectors with different skills. And so that kind of churn in the labor market is is always there. And 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 there's an important role for government in education and skills training and ensuring that there's opportunities and apprenticeship programs and supports and so on uh, to facilitate those workers changing jobs as as necessary. You know, we don't have a big textile industry anymore, largely right, right. because of international trade and a lot of employment displaced there. Manufacturing generally has actually been under a lot of pressure over the past couple of decades. And so what makes a job displaced from oil and gas or energy fundamentally different. So in my eyes, it's it's just another example of why we need responsive training programs that are keeping pace with the with the the changing times and the changing technology and the changing economic circumstances. And so it's it's not something where we should focus on oil and gas. And when we do, I think it does lead people to wonder if that's a signal that it's a sector that's going to be exposed to policy driven yeah. uh, job losses of course they're feeling targeted i mean exactly. You know, exactly and and the reality is you're not going to turn every oil rig worker into a coder you know this is the the simplistic way which uh, it sometimes fa- uh, you yeah. know describe especially but, now with ai really maybe yes. changing the nature of coding itself is- <laughs> absolutely um but it, but it it kind of is more basic um to the to that tension that exists i mean i was hearkening at the beginning back to the nep and and the why should you know this people who are born in western canada even though they may be younger they have been hearing these stories around the kitchen table for decades um and and preston manning made a whole political party out of the west wants in Um, you know, like that feeling of being a second class citizen of people not understanding of, you know, ministers telling me I should ride my bike to work when, you know, it's a three and a half hour trip to the airport. Right. Um, you know, just, it, it almost seems like a willful ignorance about huge, vast stretches of this country. Yeah. Which is problematic for a country as diverse as Canada yeah. is, where federal leaders, I think more here than in most other countries, do need to ensure they're paying careful attention to the unique circumstances that do prevail from one part of the country to another. And I think politics today, not just in Canada, but what we see in 
in lots of countries is increasingly about vote targeting and critical yeah. swing locations. And that that has some real costs, costs in Canada's case in terms of national unity. So, so I I don't view this as as some do as just a partisan disagreement between right. a conservative provincial government and a liberal federal government. No, no, no. Some of that, you know, is there, yeah. of course, but I think it's it's much deeper than that. And I'm glad you brought up the NEP. I mean, this is something where outside of Alberta, many um and Saskatchewan to yeah. a lesser extent yeah. might might wonder why do they keep bringing this up? But this was a policy that at peak shrunk Alberta's economy by 25% is my own estimate. There was just considerable. Like this one policy having such a massive economic uh, hit to a province, in order to provide benefits and subsidies for energy consumption elsewhere. And so that's a that's an example of a kind of policy that we really should not be enacting in in a country like Canada. And there's other ways for the federal government to provide supports to. Right. Those who might need it, if there's unique challenges in rural Atlantic Canada, then we can think about targeted support measures there. But to 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 shape policy consistently in a way that does at least appear, and I think credibly appears, and actually maybe does, uh, neglect interests of whole regions of the country where millions of Canadians or, or live. punitive, yeah, or punitive. And I do view the oil and gas cap there. I mean, I can't. Just on policy principles, the oil and gas oil and gas cap doesn't have a lot going for it. Right. it but it is a policy that can be used as a wedge uh, to say, like, oh, uh, our commitment to lowering emissions is, or our our emissions, our our problem here is because of oil and gas, right? shifting blame, and yeah, that. Yeah. You know, can have some political appeal because no individual wants to to hear that their behavior is contributing to a problem. It's it's somebody else, and oil and gas is an easy target here. And so yeah. I think the, the other policy. side of that whole discussion is, and and when I say willful ignorance, and and it it's true in the agricultural sector, and it's certainly true in the energy, the oil and gas sector, that both those sectors have been leading in terms of change. Um, they are greening their particular sectors. They are, you know, no farmer wants to go and dump unnecessary tons of fertilizer on their field because it's their most expensive input. Why would they do that? Uh, you know, no company wants to spend billions of dollars cleaning up tailings ponds. It's easier to, you know, prevent it in the first place, and they're doing that. But it, but the way Ottawa tends to frame it is you know, this is the industry that maybe they know knew about 30 or 40 years ago, not the industry it is today. That's a good point. And I think also critical to remember, it, since we were talking about carbon taxes, while in Alberta, I think it's fair to say not a popular uh, policy, was one that was supported by many, if not, yeah. if not most of the major players yeah. in the oil and gas sector. Um, because I, I think they they do see a responsibility uh, there, want to try and support policies that that move us forward, carbon tax being being one, but also investments in different types of technologies to lower emissions. And emissions intensity has been falling pretty um, impressively in that sector as well. And so, yeah, it's, it's not uh, an us versus them kind of black and white conversation that we should have. It's it's a hard policy area, and, and we should have an all of the above kind of approach to thinking about ideas to do it in the least cost way possible. Um, and where are the burdens? Because there are burdens of yeah. lowering emissions. It's not free. Uh, are equitably shared because it is this broader societal objective that we're trying to achieve, not something where we should single out particular sectors or particular regions to shoulder the burden. Now, one of the things that I always... Um... I, I'm a I'm old school. I keep pieces of paper. I have literal <laughs> file folders, and in my uh, Trevor Tomb file was a, a piece that you'd written about the food sector because mm. the debate rages on, um, and certainly it's good politics to haul the heads of the retail grocery chains in and say you do this or we're going to tax you, but 
the other more, what appears to be a more reasonable response to this would be, let's have some more competition in these areas and maybe prices will go down first and foremost. And secondly, if you didn't have the carbon tax on every part of the food chain, uh, transportation, you know, uh, the getting the food off the field and putting it in the store, maybe you could reduce it. Uh, so you were talking about that issue and how we need to rethink that as well. Yeah, that's right. And it does connect into our conversation around right. black and white issues. There's uh, a problem call caused by a group over there and we just need to right. brow, browbeat them into submissions. But Maybe I'll take a step back. And, and food prices is certainly one of the most important contributors to the affordability challenge that, that Canadians Absolutely. are seeing. You know, if we look at food prices now compared to two years ago, they're nearly 20% higher in, in the span of two years. That's a significant move that for an average family is equivalent to about $150 per month in yeah. additional costs. Not to purchase any more or different food, just to purchase the same basket that was being uh, bought two years previously. So it, it the strain is very real. And so governments yeah. responding to that is, a, is not surprising. But what the federal government um, announced as their solution, concrete actions, as they called it, was to call in leaders of grocery stores and have them lower prices uh, as, as though higher prices are because of them unfairly increasing them and, and right. increasing their profit margins unfairly over the past couple of years. So yeah, that that piece you mentioned that I wrote for the hub, uh, the hub.ca some time ago now kind of unpacks some of the data that that absolutely food prices are up, but 95% of the price increase is not due to changing profit margins. There is there has been a little bit of increase in profit margins, I suspect mainly because of us changing the type of food or items that we're purchasing, maybe more convenience items, which might have a, mo a higher right. margin uh, on it. But it, it's not its not as though Galen Weston is responsible for the increases in food prices that we're seeing. Food prices, for the most part, rise and fall with farm product prices. Exactly. And thinking about farm input costs and, and what have you and how those have changed, that's... Um, behind the variation in food prices that we're seeing. And, and some of the some of the increases that we've seen are tied to a lot of global developments. Fertilizer prices in particular has been a big cost increase for farmers. The second quarter of 2022 fertilizer costs were about double what they were just one year prior. And the the war in Ukraine, Russia's invasion, there is That's a big factor. And so Lots of lots of external things, but energy, machinery, fuel. This is an important input cost as well. Energy prices also rose through 2022 because of global oil prices, and carbon taxes are a factor. And and estimates vary. And I, I think it's fair to say we don't uh, want to hang our hat in a specific estimate. Yeah. And it varies by province, but they're maybe raising food prices by at most about one percent. So that's the the most recent Statistics Canada estimate. So so not nothing. No yeah. question, not nothing, but the the large increase and the sudden and rapid increase that we've seen is really about energy fertilizer, and hopefully the worst is behind us. We're starting to see farm product prices yeah. now fall. Uh, so right now, farm product price indexes tracked by StatCan is lower than one year ago. That doesn't mean that gets us back to prices of yeah, two no, no. years ago. So there's still an affordability challenge, but the inflation that we're seeing, the pace of growth, that might be done very soon. By the end of the year, the food price CPI index from StackCan might be right back down to normal and potentially negative. Um, now, what, what troubles me, I guess, politically with the federal government announcement is they announced their goal was to stabilize food prices. Yes. It was Phrase. And that's, I suspect, because they saw where we're headed, because right. farm product prices, they tend to lead changes in consumer price indexes by about six months, give or take. So we, we can see where product prices are now, and then yeah. start the clock. And that's a really good guess about where consumer prices 
are headed. And that's why I strongly think by the end of the year, consumer food prices yeah. will. And then the government yeah. gets to claim credit. And exactly. Say, exactly. We were exactly. so tough on these guys. They're, exactly. They're, Even though it's really just due to these external things yeah, and yeah. doesn't eliminate the problem. What we've done is ratcheted price levels up to a new higher plane than they were at before. So even if food price growth returns to a normal 2% a year, uh, everything is still more expensive. And that means yeah. standards of, of, of living are, are lower than they were. So, And that's a broader statement about inflation. Even once it gets back to normal, the affordability challenge is still there. It's just not getting any worse. But I think you you've made such an important point today that the the thread through all these various topics that we've that we've hit on today is that the solution from from the political class is to just find a bad guy and pin it on him. The provinces blame the feds, the feds That's blame right. yeah. the provinces, the government blames the food industry that you know on and on it goes big bad oil it doesn't that and and it really in the end doesn't get us from point a to point b it just divides us it doesn't move us i think that's exactly right now i i don't know how to get out of that space but we are indeed yeah. seeing it in, in lots of political leaders so I, i'm not just singling out the feds here no, no, i think exactly. that's a fair way to characterize uh, right now, the political dynamics in general in Canada. Well, this is your job as a professor of economics. You're going to have to some, think some big thoughts about this. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, no, it's uh, I really appreciate your work because you you do um, put these issues in context, and I think people have to understand that. You know, as you say, food prices or what is the fight about the CPP really about and. So uh, thank you, Trevor. We appreciate you uh, taking this on. I know it seemed like a big list of things, but we <laughs> got through it. Oh, Trevor, my pleasure. It was great to chat with you. Yeah, it was great to see you again. Uh, Trevor Toome. So he's a professor of economics at the University of Calgary and a research fellow at the School of Public Policy and is part of this process, uh, along with the Canadian Tax Foundation, to really try and get a handle on public finance data and make it more available to people so that we're having conversations about real numbers and not just who's a bad guy on this. And you can read him regularly on the hub to because um, uh, he publishes a lot there. All right. Thank you. And I'm sure we'll talk again soon. Thank you, Senator. Until next time. Okay. Thanks a lot. And that is it for this edition of No Nonsense with Pamela Wallen. See you soon.